What's up, guys? I'm Jamie Tajera, and um, I'm with Property Bear at Keller Williams here in Jacksonville, Florida. So <clears throat> this video is basically talking about, um, you know, taking advantage of the fear that's kind of going on from a national standpoint um, and kind of why we're leaning into the investor, um, you know, game, if you will, um, which is something we we haven't done in probably five years. Um we, of course, have been investing. We've been buying properties. But from an acquisition standpoint, we're actually looking more at turnkey rentals right now than we are retail flips um, and making those available to our customers. Um, so let's take a look at the current retail buyer right now. Um, a lot of them are priced out of ownership, right? So you've got a bunch of you know buyers that have basically turned into renters, right? Um, mortgage rates, are a direct result of that. Are, are rates going to come down like nobody has a crystal ball? Everyone thinks they're going to. There's a lot of reasons why that prediction makes a lot of sense, right? So, you know, in, in 2009, 10, there were, you know, basically there was kind of a similar sentiment, right? Except there was a different scenario. Um, not a lot of people were buying houses. They were scared of it, whatever. And there were some people that were buying a lot of houses, and today those people are all retired. Um, I actually know two of them. One of them still flipping houses, but the other one's basically developing Jacksonville at this point um, and doing awesome stuff, most of the stuff that you, you see. But all of that started from you know buying these properties when nobody else wanted to. So um, for a lot of these retail buyers, it is a luxury to own a property. Um, Fear-based media nationally, um, it, there's this weird phenomenon um, like panic selling in the stock market where people tend to sell when things are red and they tend to buy when things are green, when it should be the other way around. Um, you know, last year, most of the customers that we helped were actually sellers because we knew that, hey, this is a time to sell right now. Um, everything was green, right? And usually when you start seeing you know, people pile in, it's it's greed, right? When something starts running up and people are trying to get a piece of it, it's greed. Um, and you see that in the stock market, you see it in real estate too. And it definitely happened last year. So um, is it 2008? Uh, no. And we'll go over some reasons why. Um, but is it 2008, 9, 10 from a buying standpoint? So some of the best properties we bought were in 9, 10, 11, 12, right? pretty low interest rates. Um, and for me, low is under six, to be honest. Um, and we had our pick of the litter and retail buyers were nowhere to be found. Um, we were also working with institutions to buy these properties um, because they raised a bunch of money knowing that the general public was kind of asleep at the wheel. So how do institutions take advantage of times like this? Um, from a personal standpoint, I don't know that this is going to last as long as it did. I think we've got January of 23 and maybe up until the summer. Um, the reason for that is basically interest rates are, you know, from a federal fund rate standpoint, you know, banks are already preparing for a recession. And what happens in a recession from an interest rate standpoint is they lower them to re-stimulate the economy. So it's like basically what we just did with COVID, um, with the interest rates, and we're going to end up doing it again, and it's a product of our own, you know, Fed policy. Um, but how do institutions take advantage of this? So build to rent communities. So you drive down, you know, Clay County, Duval County, and you see these brand new communities, and you're probably thinking, man, there's a bunch of houses that are going to be for sale, and then they never go for sale, and you actually see for rent signs in front of all of them. There are entire companies dedicated to developing neighborhoods and renting them all out. Um, turnkey rentals, there's these, um, institutions are still buying, um, you know, older homes, renovating them and turning them into rentals. One of the key factors you're going to notice is all of these are entry level homes, right? You're not seeing them do this with houses over four or 500,000 in our market. So he, the big question is why are, why is this happening, right? Why have they been doing this since 2012? So do you remember 2008 and the mortgage-backed security thing? So mortgage-backed securities are a way for, you know, and mortgages in general, for 
institutions to get a piece of the pie from the American wealth building system, right? So for the general American, they buy their first house, right? If they're able to, right? And, and you've got history and years of, of redlining and all of this bad stuff that went on, you know, for, for certain, you know, types of people and it was, and it's really messed up. And so now when you look at it and the institutions are saying, it's, it's all about profit, right? So like, and you're looking at wealth for the general American, their first house is generally where they build their wealth. And they buy this house, it appreciates, they sell it, they roll it into their next house, right? And if as long as they're pretty safe and secure about this, you know, they pass away and they hand that wealth over to their children and the cycle continues. What happens if they never buy that first house? You basically eliminated that, but somebody can take advantage of that, right? So what if you could remove that piece of the puzzle from the general consumer and as an institution, you get the benefit of all of that and then multiply that times hundreds of thousands of homes. You have now securitized the entry level wealth builder for Americans, right? And if you're a retail buyer watching this and you're like, this is kind of scary, it is what it is. This is the market and that's what's happening in, in our market, right? In Jacksonville. Um, in Jacksonville, we're 44% rentals. Um, and if it's possible, like think about the pitch, right, from the institutions to, you know, the next generation of home buyers. Like, why do you want to commit to home ownership? Like, you see this stuff on TikTok and Instagram all the time. Like, why do you want to commit to home, home ownership? Like, why not take advantage of the flexibility of renting? You don't have to worry about anything. Like, everything, you can, you can move. You can move to another place. Like, not a big deal, right? What they're not talking about is that big rollover that generally happens between you know, 25 to 35, right? 25 to 30, 30 to 35, and they keep rolling that over. Um, so here's a perfect example for quarter four of 2022, probably one of the worst months, um, and we can pull this up for previous months, and the numbers are actually higher, right? But look at, look at the numbers that we're showing here. From the price points of zero to 300,000, 50% of the sales or cash. These are either small investors that have cash or these are large institutions, right? We know this because we work with them. We know what they're looking for. 1950 and above, they have to meet certain criteria. Like it is the perfect entry level home that these institutions are targeting, right? And you're probably thinking, I'm not an institution. Why am I even paying attention anymore? The thing is, is that some of those sales are also happening, you know, for local investors, right? And this whole video is like, how do I as an investor, look at it the same way institutions are looking at it right now, right? And we just had one of the funds that um, we sold stuff to last year make a public announcement on LinkedIn that, hey, we're buying houses, please send it to this email address, like just publicly. They've never done that before. They're actually looking for more inventory. Um, we also saw another institution on one of the um, the builder that we work with, one they just closed on like 42 homes in, in a little subdivision um, in December. So my point here is look at look at what they're targeting and then think about like what you're trying to target from an investment standpoint. And again, if you're a retail buyer and you're looking at this, pay attention to what I'm saying because your window, it might be closing. Um, you might want to call a realtor to, to talk about what that looks like for your area because every area is a little different. So, um, oh, and these numbers are purely based off MLS, right? These developments that we're talking about when they build entire neighborhoods and rent them out, those don't go on MLS. They never even touch MLS. So you're talking about 50, 60, 70, 120 unit developments that are all for rentals. All right. So the inventory squeeze in Jacksonville, right? So um, why are we looking at an inventory squeeze? Um, economic pain from other markets, right? So is there economic pain being felt nationwide? Sure. Is it worse in other places? Yes. Where do they go? Um, probably places that don't have a state tax where they can probably free up some of that income. We already saw that during COVID. We saw it last year. We saw it the year before. Um, Florida had Florida and Jacksonville alone had massive growth uh, from a population standpoint. Um, at this point, builders are unincentivized to continue the flow of building. Um, if you pay attention to the National Home Builders Sentiment uh, Score Index, um, 
it's down and it's down pretty bad. They control a bunch of land still, um, but there's no reason for them to build fast, right? If you go under contract, they'll build you a house, right? Um, so you're not going to see this influx of housing. The other part of it is, especially for us um, with with kind of an affordable product, we also have the other exit of those institutions. So it, those houses never hit the market. They just end up going straight to the institutions and becoming a rental property. Um, owners that own properties right now are locked into low interest rates. There's no reason for them to turn over. You'll, you, people have already talked about that. So you're, you're not going to see a bunch of those properties come to the market. Um, again, inventory is being sold to institutions. So it's like retail buyers are quietly being rug pulled um, from an inventory standpoint. And I think they think they're being smart sitting on the sidelines. But when it comes down to six months to a year from now and they don't have anything to buy and their only option is to rent, they'll probably look back and say, dang, I should have probably bought something. Um, and then there's low distress. So a lot of people, uh, we like to call them the crash bros, are worried about um, foreclosures. Um, from an acquisition standpoint, you know, we, we like to buy properties at the foreclosure auction. It's one of the best places to buy. It's unemotional. It is what it is. Um, you know, you buy a property there and, and in 10 days you get a CT. The problem is right now, our distress levels are very, very low. There's not a lot of foreclosures at the auction. There's not a lot of foreclosures or short sales on the market. Um, so that theory is out the window as far as crashing. So internal rate of return from an investment standpoint on residential real estate, you're looking at 27 and a half years of depreciation. That's kind of an unrealized return. You're writing that off under taxes. Cost segregation, if you're doing um, Airbnb, furniture, um, uh, appliances, stuff like that. And then, of course, appreciation. So these are all, you know, unrealized gains. Um, in commercial real estate, um, we see it a lot where people are buying apartment complexes for the pure purpose of needing some sort of depreciation and some sort of write-off. Um, so for single-family rentals for Jacksonville, we're doing dual underwriting, um, long-term rental and short-term rental, um, and tolerances for both. We saw during the little boom, um, a lot of people were underwriting properties purely as short-term rentals, and now they're taking losses on rentals because they don't pencil out as long-term rentals. Um, right, because, you know, supply, demand, et cetera, right? You want to have both. You want it to underwrite as a long term, um, take advantage of those unrealized gains too. And then if it works as a short term, great, it's a bonus. So property targets um, for existing homes. So you kind of have everything kind of flexible here, but from f what we would be looking for is whether we're buying it and renovating it, a full four point is a huge bonus. Roof, AC, plumbing, and electrical. Why are all those things a big deal? Because one of the things that affects your cash flow is insurance, especially in Florida. If you can knock out a four point and you know everything's covered, your insurance um, you know burden is going to be lower. Um, demand areas. So generally, your not going to be able to find, you know, subdivisions in Jacksonville are spreading out further and further because where are you going to find large amounts of land, right? Um, you're going to find your higher price points in places where there's not a lot of supply to build new neighborhoods, right? So infill, stuff like that. Um, and those are higher demand areas, right? So an example is, you know, the beaches or San Marco, um, Riverside, like there's areas where those price points are going to be prohibitive from a, you know, long-term rental standpoint in some cases. Um, but in those areas, they're almost like recession proof, right? There's, there's just some of those areas and those are them. Um, and even on the outskirts of some of them, right? Um, appreciation versus rental ROI. So in this case for existing homes, a perfect example is you're going to get a lower cap rate in some of your higher demand areas, um, but you're going to get better appreciation rates because those areas are more in demand. Um, you can buy properties in war zones and you're going to get higher returns from a long-term rental standpoint, um, you know, on paper, assuming assuming what your risk factors are and, and stuff like that. Um, deferred maintenance reduction. So, if you're getting a property that doesn't have a new four point and all of that stuff, 
discount it accordingly because you're going to have to put in that deferred maintenance. In your case, do you want to buy something with a three-point where you put on the roof in a few years and you take that depreciation? That's a strategy you can look for. Um, hard surfaces is a bonus. You want um, you want granite countertops. Um, I know that sounds crazy for a rental property, but you want stuff that you're not going to have to replace, right? Um, or you're not going to have to replace often. Um, so here's an example of one. Um, this one's in Murray Hill. This is a full four-point pass. Um, plumbing, electrical, uh, AC, and roof. It's got all hard surfaces, um, granite. It's a perfect existing turnkey rental property. Um, it, it, it will have zero problem renting. And the other thing is, is this one is also in an area where it would function very well as a short-term rental. Um because because of where it's at. Um, and then underwriting these, so from an example standpoint with the dual underwriting, so you've got the long-term rental side and the short-term rental side. We work with probably <clears throat> one of the best managers for short-term rentals in Jacksonville. And they helped us come up with, with our performance for these because we're also interested in doing it ourselves, right? So, um, they have all the fees basically figured out. And does it cost more money to run a short-term rental? Yes. Um, can you find a manager like this one to handle it for you? Yes, their, their company is Joseph Allen Properties. You can check them out. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it costs more, but if the return is higher there, um, then it makes sense. In this example, you can see that the cap rate's at about right under 6%. And then, you know, on a cash basis, and then on a short-term rental standpoint, the realized return on cash with a 25% down payment is over 12%. So on this property, does it make sense to take the risk, buy the, um, the furniture, um, you know, do all that stuff, and then do long-term or short-term rental with it? Absolutely. And if that doesn't work, you fall back to a 6% cap rate, right? But with the tolerances that we have in here, like we've got occupancy rates of 65%, like they're really low and it's seasonal based, right? So you have up seasons, down seasons. Um, but the way it's calculated is extremely conservative to make sure that that number actually works. So going on to new construction, um, and of course I'm, I'm highlighting Breeze Homes here because we, you know, we work with them um, and it is a perfect turnkey product. Um, we actually had to limit the amount of homes we could sell in a neighborhood um, to investors because there was so much demand for them as investment products. So, in, and, and actually in 2023, as far as the hard surface goes, all of the finished packages will have granite countertops. Like they are perfect um, long-term rentals. Um, yes, you're usually buying them at a premium. Um, the two options you have is finding new construction that's infill versus an HOA. Um, Obviously, in an HOA, you're probably not going to be allowed to do a short-term rental, so you're purely looking at long-term rental cash flow, um, under underwriting for that. And um, now, in some cases, you are you are going to be allowed to do the short-term rental, but you're going to have to make sure that you know both of those scenarios, um, and you want to make sure you're underwriting to make sure you're going to be okay. Now, with you know, with Breeze, right, as an example. Can you buy property in an established neighborhood? Um, yes, for an individual investor, I actually like that better than trying to, you know, if you were able to put your money into a neighborhood that was all rental properties, like one of these institutional ones, the only problem is what if you need to exit? It's really hard to exit a neighborhood when the retail buyers come in and they're like, oh my God, all of these are rentals, that's not good, right? Whereas if you're buying in a Breeze Homes community as a rental property, you know, over 60% of those homes are owner occupied. So what ends up happening is when, if you wanna to sell to a retail buyer, it's much easier for you to do that. So pay attention to that. Honestly, it's probably gonna be impossible for you to buy one or two houses in one of these institutionally owned neighborhoods, but just keep that in mind because, you know, if it were me, I would rather have, you know, the, min the minority, right, from a rental standpoint in a neighborhood. Um, and then we talked about finished packages and, and what makes sense there from, from a rental standpoint. So this is an example of one for 2023. Um, I love these because it's basically duplex style townhomes. They're sold individually. They can be sold to retail buyers. Um, 
and of course investors, this one has an HOA, but it's not like a full neighborhood. Um, and it's all hard surfaces on the first floor. So you've got final plank on the first floor, granite countertops. Um, it's basically bulletproof. And then upstairs, it's um, carpet, right? So when you do a tenant turn, are you replacing paint and upstairs carpet? Yes. Are you replacing downstairs? No. What's the deal with granite, right? The deal with the granite is that if you've ever owned a rental property that had Formica, no matter what, for some reason, water gets under the sink and it bubbles up. And after two tenant turns, you're replacing the countertops. Just go straight with granite. It's it's basically unbreakable, right? Um, and so underwriting this, you see you've, you, you've kind of got a lower cap rate on this one um, than on that existing one. And you we... We kind of lowered the short-term rental number just because where this property is located, the short-term rental numbers aren't great, right? So usually, unless you're paying a real premium and you're finding an infill somewhere that's going to be in higher demand for short-term rental, um, most of them that you're looking for in the, in the price point that we're targeting, right, that entry-level home is going to be long-term rental on the new construction side, right? But new construction you've also got lower maintenance because it's brand new. You're getting a home warranty on it, um, which you should also have your customer, right? Or your, your tenant using, because the tenant's your customer, using that if there's ever an issue, right? But they're probably not gonna have an issue for a long time. Um, so that's kind of the, that's kind of the, uh, you know, the give and take on new construction versus existing when you're looking at at these as as investments so if you have any questions um email us uh or give us a call uh we'd love to talk to you about you know long-term rental short-term rental options um and see how we can help um and if you're a retail buyer obviously our agents can help you with that too but as far as as what we were talking about in this video it's it's definitely geared towards um investors trying to target the same thing that those institutions are